Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahabihi Wa man tabiyahum bi ihsan ila yawmiddin Tonight inshallah we look at this great topic An-Nisa'u fil Islam Women in Islam And this is very important This could be one of the major topics in Islam Women in Islam Sometimes you will term it to be the rights of women or the status of women in Islam. However, and whatever they decide to say, we need to understand Islam. We need to understand this topic in some details. We need to kick off with the idea that the Prophet ﷺ has elevated Islam by the advent of the Quran, by his advent, and by the revival of Islam per se, when it started off or continued at the point of the Prophet ﷺ. Islam elevated women. In what sense? Because the Prophet ﷺ has been the greatest benefactor of women folk. And we can look at it historically as to who was the first person who accepted Islam at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. And I think you know the answer for that. Who was the first person to be martyred in Islam? I think you know the answer for that. Who was the first person who stood up against the oppression and cruelty of Pharaoh from a national and international standpoint? I think you know the answer for that. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was one of the greatest fuqaha in Islam, one of the greatest scholars in Islam, from whom the Sahaba used to study ahkam wa sharia. Let's recap that a bit. Who was the first person who accepted Islam at the hands of the Prophet it was Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Who was the first person to be martyred? It was Sumayya. Who was the first person to stand up against the oppression and cruelty of Pharaoh from a national and international standpoint? It was Asiya, rahmatullahi alayhi, the wife of Pharaoh. Now we can see that all of these figures, they were all women. They come under the category of An-Nisa. So when one speaks about An-Nisa fil Islam, we need to mention these prominent figures in Islam, like Asiya, like Aisha, the like Khadija, and many more. But at the time of the Prophet وسلم, there were a lot of things that were happening in that society. You would find that before he came that women were considered to be a threat to family honor. Infanticide was rampant. Baby girls were used to be buried alive, as the Quran informs us. And when the baby child that is buried alive would be asked, By what sin, what sin have I committed? And then on Yom al the people who are involved in this, the people who are involved in these crimes, there would be questioned on Yom al What was the sin that she committed that she was buried alive? Was it because of the fact that she committed crime? Or was it because she was a female? She was just a girl. She was just a child. And she was buried alive. So Islam gives legitimacy to women when they were considered to be a commodity in society. Object of sexual gratification. And at a time when they used to debate whether women were human or not. Incredible. Sometimes you don't think about these things. That was the situation in the Arab Peninsula at that time. But Islam has eradicated this concept from the very initial phase. And when I say initial phase, even from the initial phase of creation, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam and Hawa. If you were to look at that, just briefly, that the first sin that was committed, and Adam and Hawa, they were expelled from Jannah, then we need to understand who was the first person to commit the sin. Sometimes we think that it was Hawa who committed the sin. And then she instigated Adam to commit the sin. And because of that, women were given a second-class citizen Status in society. Who ate from the forbidden tree? And sometimes we think again that it was all because of Hawa. It was Eve 
who ate first, and then she instigated Adam to do so. Was it Adam or was it Hawa who ate first? Who gets the greater blame of that incident? And sometimes there's a lot of confusion, confusion from a biblical narrative and confusion in our understanding as well. And that's mainly because we don't focus on the Quran. We don't focus on the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, the most authentic hadith. If we focus on the wrong information, we will come up with the wrong conclusion. Because if you were to read the Bible, the Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us that it was Eve who instigated Adam. And it was the serpent that instigated Eve. And because of that, women have greater sin to receive. As you can see in the Bible, if you to read Genesis 3.16, it says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule upon thee. According to the King James Version, Genesis 3.16, that tells us that because of her, because of Eve instigating Adam to eat from the forbidden tree, then in a way she was cursed. And in a way, she was given this extra burden, the burden of conception and the burden that she needs to bring forth children and to bear the pains and pangs of pregnancy. And then she shall be for the desire of her husband and he shall rule upon him. That concept in itself, a lot of people do follow that concept. I want to say a lot of people, a lot of Muslims do follow that concept. And a lot of Muslims do believe in it. Whereas in Islam, we have a different perception because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us something different. If you were to read the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ He said, and when we spoke to the angels, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اُسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ and when we spoke to the angels, or we said to the angels, prostrate to Adam, they all prostrated except Iblis. He was proud, he refused and was proud, and he was among the disbelievers. And then we said, Oh Adam, you stay there, and your spouse, you stay, both of you in Jannah. And both of you should eat. A command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not kul, but kule, referring to the jewel in number. Both of you, Adam and Hawa. And both of you eat from wherever you wish. Both of you. And do not approach. Again, both of you, a command. To both of you, do not approach this tree. Or as both of you are going to meet about the wrong do wrongdoers. Both of you would be among the wrongdoers, the volumeen. And then Shaitan caused both of them to slip. Huma again means that he caused both of them to slip, to make a mistake, to be among the wrongdoers. And then both of them were expelled from Jannah. So it's not like one of them instigating the other. It was both of them who committed the crime of eating from the forbidden tree. And the Quran doesn't state that it was the fruits that they ate. And the Quran doesn't state that it was the apple that they ate. But some Muslims do believe that. Because sometimes we get tangled up into the biblical narration or the scholars from the Bible as to what was eaten by Adam السلام, and Hawa. But the Quran states that they have eaten from the tree. And this is what we need to be very careful with. And in terms of we talk about the blame as to who do we blame? You know, in Islam, the men have more responsibility than women. And everything that happens in the family circle, the men would have the greater blame for what's happened because they have greater responsibilities. 
And it's natural when people have greater responsibilities, they have greater sense of accountability. And Yawm al they will have to answer more than those who have less responsibility and those who have got a less sense of accountability on Yawm al That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you can see the ayah on the slides there, Ya Bani Adam, La yaftinannakum shaytan لا يفتننكم الشيطان كما أخرج أبويكم من الجنة O children of Adam, do not let Satan or do not let the devil deceive you as he tempted your parents and they were expelled from Jannah. They were expelled from paradise. Now it's worth think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here. He says, يا بني آدم O children of Adam لا يفتننكم الشيطان do not allow shaitan to tempt you, to give you such a trial so that you deviate from the right path. In the way that he caused both of your parents to be expelled from Jannah. Now, not the Arabic that is mentioned here in the Quran. In the like manner that he caused both of your parents to be expelled from Jannah. Abawaykum. See, Abawaykum refers to your parents. But Abawaykum has an emphasis in the word Abi or Abun. Because Abun means father. So when this phrase is used in the Quran, according to the scholars of the language itself, the ulama al-Lugha, Abawaykum gives an emphasis to the father. So in terms of this incident itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word abawaykum, which means that there is some sort of emphasis on the father. He's got greater responsibility. Unlike other verses in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about parents, he uses the word walidain because he's talking about responsibilities and duties primarily to the mother. But he's addressing both the father and the mother. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, And for your master has decreed that you worship none but him and honor your parents. Ihsan ila walidayk, meaning to honor your parents, to be extremely generous to them. So in this ayah, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about ihsan, ihsan to your parents. But the word that he actually used here when he uses the word parents is walidain and not abawain because the emphasis in walidain comes from the word wilade, which refers to maternity. It refers to motherhood initially. So that's where the word actually comes from. So the emphasis in this area always referring to both parents, the mother and the father, the emphasis in the mother. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعَبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدِينَ إِحْسَانًا And for your master, he has decreed that you worship none except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only your parents. But if one of them or both of them reach old age in your care, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنَّكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Then don't even say a word of hurt to them. Do not indicate anything that would hurt them. And do not yell at them. And talk to them in kindness. Talk to them respectfully. Talk to them with words of generosity and words of kindness. So we can see in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word walidain. As opposed to the ayah before, he used the word abawi in this area. Kama akhraja abawikum. And the emphasis here is on the word abawi, abawikum. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his wisdom, he uses words very precisely and he uses construction very precisely. The style is incredible. And even within that, we have knowledge, we have lessons to learn. Likewise, in another ayah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks again about being kind to human beings, and he talks about kindness to parents, he says, And remember, when we took the covenant from the children of Israel, stating, 
وإذا خفنا ميثاق بني إسرائيل لا تعبدون إلا الله that do not worship anything except Allah سبحانه وتعالى وبالوالدين إحسانا and again he talks about إحسان he talks about generosity and kindness towards parents he mentions the word وبالوالدين وبالوالدين إحسانا وذو القربى واليتامى والمساكين وقول للناس حسنا وقيموا الصلاة وقيموا الزكاة ثم تبليتم إلى قليل منكم وأنتم معرضون that Allah subhanahu continues to say you worship none but him and you be kind to your parents, relatives, orphans, needy and speak kindly to people establish prayer and pay zakah these are the commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so initially the first part of the ayah is Allah subhanahu wa says لا تعبدون إلا الله وبالوالدين إحسانا so the emphasis here in the word بالوالدين the emphasis is on the mother because generosity and kindness precedes that of the father and I have said the emphasis is on that of the mother that is why the Prophet sallallahu tells us in a hadith that when we talk about being obedient and carrying out our responsibilities who among you who among the people is most deserving of a fine treatment from my hand meaning it's who among you Man nas bi husni sahabati. that who has got the greatest rights to companionship Man nas bi husni sahabati. Paul, when the prophet وسلم, was asked that that who has got the greatest rights in terms of companionship to be kind to to be generous to, that earn our respect. The Prophet said, Qala ummuk. He says, your mother. Qala thumma man. Qala ummuk. Qala thumma man. Qala ummuk. Qala thumma man. Qala thumma abuk. So the Prophet وسلم, when he was asked about this close or affinity of companionship in terms of generosity and kindness, who takes precedence over any other person? The Prophet وسلم, said, your mother. And then the person asks, who comes next? And he said, your mother. You would expect a different answer. He said, your mother again. And then he said, who came next? And then he said, your mother. For the third time, he says, your mother. And when he was asked on the fourth time, who came next? Then he said, thumma abu. Then your father, as if the mother has won the gold medal, the silver medal, the bronze medal, and the collation prizes for the father. There is no silver medal for the father, there is no bronze medal for the father, and there is no gold medal for the father. It all goes to the mother. So Islam, in fact, has given priority, in this case, to women than men, instead of being the opposite way. In fact, it's Islam says the women who are mothers, they have greater responsibilities from their children, or they should execute greater responsibilities to their mother. So it's a higher status that has been given to that of women when they take on this role of motherhood. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us some understanding and help us so that we can understand fil Islam. We should always think about this area in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. فَاسْتَجَيْبَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ Let your master answer the prayer. لَا أُضِيَ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى But I do not allow the labor or the effort made by any one of you to go in waste, male or female. مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى It doesn't mean that the deed of a female is less than that of a male. There is no concept like that in Islam. In fact, there is no concept in Islam where Islam talks about men are superior to women. If you have heard it, you haven't heard it from the Quran because the Quran didn't say that. For those who believe in that, it would be nice to see which ayah in the Quran says that. Which ayah in the Quran says that men are superior to women. Neither does the Quran mention that women are superior to men. No. It's only with our deeds. The noblest of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one with most piety. And piety is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So that is why in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa reminds us, فَسَجَابَ لَهُ رَبُّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضِيُّ عَمَلَ عَامِلِ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow the deed, the effort, and the work of any one of you to go waste. مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى That of men and women. It doesn't only have to be men. Of that, مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى the deeds being done by a male or the deeds being done by a female. Ba'adukum min ba'ad. But you are from each other. Ba'adukum min ba'ad. Meaning that men are from women and women are from men. Because that's the way we come into this world. That's the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established. We are from each other. Men are from women and women are from men. So how can we say that one is superior than the other or one is inferior than the other? The Quran doesn't state to that. And sometimes you need to listen carefully as to what the Qur'an states in terms of concept, in terms of understanding. And we would appreciate that the greatest women in history, if we were to go back to history and to understand a few things. I've mentioned this briefly. Who was the first person to be against the dictatorship and against the most powerful man on the face of the earth? That was Asiye. The first person, the wife of Fir'aun, who stood up against aggression, who stood up against dictatorship, who stood up against cruelty, who stood up against oppression. It was Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, a lady that had the world of wealth at her feet and also had the cruelest of person, the most oppressive person on the face of the earth to be her husband. That was Fir'aun, Pharaoh. What did she choose? She chose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she stood up against dictatorship. It wasn't a man that stood up against him on the first instance. It was Asiyah. It was a lady that stood up against him. Who was the first person to accept Islam in the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Was it a man or a woman? Of course, it was a woman. It was Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Who was the first person to be martyred in Islam? Sumayya. It wasn't a man. It was a woman in Islam. Who was the first to perform sa'i? You know, when you go to Hajj, you have to make the sa'i from Safa to Marwa, and Marwa to Safa, Safa, Marwa. Who was the first person in the history of Islam to do that? It was not a man. It was Hajar. Who was the first to spend their wealth in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the advent of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It was his wife, Khadija. In whose honor was the Zamzam established? It was an honor of Hajar. So you can see, it's all women, 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 women. You might think that women are taking over Islam now and they're taking over everything. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was one of the greatest fuqaha, one of the greatest scholars in Islam who used to teach the Sahaba ahkam wa sharia. Do we have those now? Do we have this quality of women existing in the world today? Do we have these people of this status in the world today? Do we have great scholars like Aisha in the world today? And I'm talking about women folk. So Islam is open up to everyone. And these were some of the prominent figures that you can see in the history of Islam. These are not the only ones. These are just some of them. As you can see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when he talks about role models, sometimes we think that we only have role models in terms of men. We think about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We think about, we think about Abu Bakr. We think about Umar and Uthman and Ali. And we think about Khalid bin Walid and all these kind of illustrious personalities. And we are oblivious of some of these great women that were mentioned in the Quran. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned women to be role models for both disbelievers and believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, it says, But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala point for you an example for those who disbelieve. The wife of Noah, and the wife of Lot, the wife of Lot, and the wife 
of Noah, the wife of Nuh, and the wife of Lut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coined for us an example. What is this example? That both of them were under our righteous servants. And they deceive both of them. These were wives of prophets. These were wives of men who were inspired by the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they rejected them. Meaning they rejected their own husband. And there is nothing that can avail them. There is nothing that can avail them. There is nothing that can save them from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it to be said to them that enter the fire with those who enter. Why? Because they've been deceptive to their husband. They have been deceptive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have been deceptive to the messengers of Allah. They rejected the truth and they decided and accepted falsehood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also coined for us a similitude or an example in the life of women in the history of Islam. Role model for the believers. If قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنة ونجني من فرعون وعملي ونجني من القوم الظالمين. This example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has coined for us in the Quran is very important so that we can understand this example, this role model that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran. It says, ضرب الله وضرب الله مثلا للذين آمنوا امرأة فرعون, the wife of Fir'aun. Who was the wife of your own? Asiya. We spoke with her briefly. If Qalat, when she said, Her dua, her supplication, her desire, her aspiration was that she wanted a place in Jannah. Ibni li, Rabbi ibni li, my master, make for me, build for me a house in Jannah. She got a great house over here. She had a mansion. She had everything that she wanted here in terms of wealth and even power. But what was she interested in? She aspired to get Jannah. That make for me a house in Jannah. And save me from Pharaoh and his deeds, his evil deeds. And save me from wrongdoing folks. It's a dua from Asiyah. And that's been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's an example. That's a role model that the Quran talks about in the lifestyle of Asiya. Also, another role model you have in that of Maryam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that indeed the daughter of Imran, Mary, who guided her chastity, and then he blew into her the ruh min ruhina wa saddaqat bi kalimati rabbiha and she believed in the words of Allah she believed in the words of her master wa kutubihi and that in the scriptures wa kanat min al-qanitin and she was devoutly obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so any accusation that one makes against her we need to think about how devout she was that she was extremely obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the Maryam. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised her to such a status that the Quran talks about her. And that's why I'm saying that we need to think about some of these role models that we have. What if call it al And when the angel said, Ya Maryam, O Mary, Inna Allah astafaki, wa tahharaki, wa astafaki ala nisa'i al-alameen. That, O oh Mary, that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preferred you. When the angel said, O oh Mary, Inna Allah astafaki, that Allah has chosen you and he has purified you and he has chosen you above all the women in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us, given her this special status, the special status because it's an honor to Maryam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only talking about men being in a very lustrous position and men are prominent or men are educated or men are always closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, 
the same status of being given to women, that they could be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And this is important for us to understand because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given status, honor, and respect to both men and women. We have spoken about this ayah briefly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you should not worship anyone except him. And it's important for us to understand that because soon after mentioning that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ihsan to parents. So we can understand women in Islam and the status of women in Islam and the rights that they have because their rights are tremendous. These are some of the misconceptions some people have that women are inferior to that of men. We don't have that in Islam. In fact, Islam elevated women. In committing the first sin, just to recap a bit, we have mentioned that, that women are to be blamed because the first sin that was committed in Jannah was because of a woman. That is not true as well. That's a misconception in Islam. Everyone is accountable for his or her own deeds. Men do have greater responsibilities, not women. And because they have greater responsibilities, they are more liable on Yom Al-Qiyam. Greater respect to women than men in some cases, like we talk about women being the role of mother. Women have been challenging authority. Women are role models in Islam. And next week, inshallah, we will continue some different aspects of women and their role and how they are seen in society and what role they should have been playing. And to, again, get rid of some of those misconceptions that we have about them.